Good evening, everyone. God, I feel like Big Brother here on this screen. You can't get away, 1984. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I promise this will be the longest introduction you will have to endure from me this year. You won't have to go through this again. <clears throat> Welcome to the beginning of the uh, 2020, 20, 2021 season of the Tallahassee Historical Society. Uh, and welcome to a new era. Uh, my name is Bob Holliday. This truly is, I think, the moment when we enter the 21st century. This is our 87th year. Uh, I cannot say that we would have made the changes we have made without the COVID-19 pandemic. But beginning in March, the situation was taken from our control. For the foreseeable future, we will be holding our meetings virtually by Zoom webinar. And no, unfortunately, that does not mean that we will have virtual food. Over the summer, Brendan Krellen, our board member in charge of technology, helped us brainstorm on the best way to do this. We were ably assisted by Mary Ellen Clark, and Joanna Oates, while Marjorie and I nodded periodically and pretended to know what we were doing. In the end, it was decided to get a Zoom webinar account that will allow up to 100 people to register and take part in our meetings, including asking questions of our speakers. I will assume that you have downloaded Zoom software on your computer and registered for this meeting which you will need to do for each of our meetings in advance by getting onto our webpage, www.tallahasseehistoricalsociety.org. A few housekeeping measures. Once you entered the webinar, you were muted for feedback control. During this webinar, the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen may be used to submit any questions for Evor to be answered at the end of his presentation, time permitting. Um, should you experience any technical issues, please contact us through the chat feature. Assisting our speaker today and monitoring your questions in the Q&A will be Mary Ellen Clark. We've also started a Tallahassee Historical Society YouTube channel where we will be posting videos of our meetings and other videos as well such as interviews with local authors. Even though we very much miss the face-to-face -face camaraderie from our meetings, doing it this way will enable members of the Historical Society who have not been able to attend our Thursday evening meetings to log on to YouTube and watch them that way. Because we do hope to go back to face-to-face -face meetings when we are sure that the coast is really clear, we have not made a long-term commitment to Zoom. We're doing this on a month-to-month -month basis. The Zoom webinar account costs us $54 per month. As you know, the Historical Society is not by any means wealthy. We would like to offer monthly sponsorships for Zoom. Anyone who would like to contribute $54 to the Historical Society for the express purpose of being a Zoom sponsor will get their name or the name of their organization on our website with our thanks. Already we have commitments through February, which leaves us looking for sponsors for our March through May meetings. There's one exception to this. Most of our meeting invitations will go to our membership only. Our November 12th meeting coming one week after the presidential election and, and marking the 20th anniversary of that fun-filled 2000 presidential election will be open to a wider audience. Our participants that night will be three people who played important roles in the 2000 election. Our own Dave Lang, who was clerk of the courts, Circuit Judge Terry Lewis, who made a few rulings, and Supreme Court Justice Major Harding, who offered a word of warning to his colleagues on the Florida Supreme Court that they did not heed. 
all have agreed to make a short presentation and then take part in a panel discussion that I will moderate. This will mean that our Zoom account that month will be more expensive. We already have one sponsor, but we would welcome one or more co-sponsors. Well, this feels awkward. I feel like I'm hawking, hawking patent medicine or something. You should know that once the serious, uh, um, you should know. Anyway, if you'd like to help, please let us know. You should know that once the seriousness of the COVID became known and the 2019-2020 season halted with our February meeting, the board of the Tallahassee Historical Society at the suggestion of our treasurer, Andy Wright, extended the due date for all dues by three months. So the clock stopped running, at least for a while. We hope that you will email Andy at treasurer at tallahasseehistoricalsociety.org to find out where you stand. <clears throat> Speaking of Andy, I would like to introduce our board of directors who have had some difficult choices to make this year and have conducted themselves admirably. Marjorie Holliday is our vice president. George Allen is our secretary. Andy Wright is our treasurer. Doug Smith is our past president. Claude Kennison is an at-large member. Dave Lang is at-large. Brendan Krellen is at-large. And Brandon Ackerman is at-large. There are more people on our board than on the city commission, it turns out. Finally, down to business tonight. Uh, tonight is October the 8th. Two years ago tonight, most of us were scared to death at the sudden, and I do mean sudden, emergence of a Category 5 hurricane with the innocent sounding name of Michael, headed right for us. Thank goodness Delta is not headed for us. When Michael hit on the 10th, Marjorie and I had fled up into Georgia and the drive back home through towns like Albany was like going through a World War I battlefield. We may never fully recover. After the hurricane passed, pictures began to appear in the newspapers on the coast and here of Dog Island, one of the barrier islands near Apalachicola. The pictures were of hulks of ships buried in the sand and water and now exposed. They weren't new ships. They looked to be more than a century old. That's where our speaker tonight, Ivor Malima, came in. Ivor is a senior archaeologist with the Bureau of Archaeological Research in the Governor Martin House, where we try to hold our meetings in normal times. He led and continues to lead the archaeological research on what was exposed two years ago. And no, he won't let me go with him. We asked him to speak tonight because what he is doing is just cool. And besides, we thought he's young enough to know what he is doing with Zoom technology so that we won't make idiots of ourselves trying to, ex trying to explain it to him. Ivor, um, Ivor obtained his BA in ancient history and archeology span from the University of St. Andrews in 2013. Afterwards, he earned his MA in maritime studies from East Carolina University in 2015 focusing on the relationship between maritime technology and empire building in the 18th and 19th century. After joining the Bureau of Archaeological Research in March 2017, he specialized in the development and implementation of digital site recording and public outreach. This includes uh, photogrammetry, I can hardly pronounce that, site reconstruction, website maintenance, and video. So with all of that, and thanking Ivor in advance for allowing himself to be our guinea pig in this first meeting, I will turn things over to him. Ivor. Thank you, Bob. That was very nice. Um, I'm going to start sharing my screen here, and then we'll launch into uh, to the presentation. Uh, whoever is the host needs to activate my participant sheet, the screen sharing. Sorry about that. Uh, 
Uh, I think if you go to the participant list and right click on them, they might, some options might appear. There we go. And there it is. I'm going to start the slideshow. Perfect. Minimize that. All right. Um, I will, I have the Q&A section open uh, just in case there are questions that pop up. But as Bob said, I'm trying to hold the questions till the end. Um, if there's anything really pressing, I know somebody else is monitoring the, the chat and can let me know if I am, uh, if anything's going wrong. Uh, but without further ado, today's presentation is Shifting Sands and Ships, Hurricane Michael and Dog Island. And quick intro, you guys already have that. Um, and I'll be sending this out to, um, to the board to make sure that they can share the PowerPoint as well. But in case you ever need to reach me, my email address and phone number are right here. And you can see here um, what my academic qualifications are in case you need those. So on the menu today is uh, an intro to the Florida Bureau of Archaeological Research, or BAR, as I'll be referring to it from this slide forward. We'll be discussing um, Dog Island's history. We'll also be discussing Dog Island archaeology. Then we'll launch into the Hurricane Michael shipwrecks. We'll discuss further options for field work talk about um, some further community outreach efforts. And finally, there'll be some acknowledgements followed by a question and answer session. And the picture you see here on the right is of a washed up ship timber and Dog Island is just behind Nick Yarborough in the distance there. Um, so we were there trying to figure out if this ship timber had originated from one of those wrecks there. Uh, so quick introduction to the rest of the uh, Florida uh, BAR underwater stuff. So for those of you who don't know, uh, Ryan Duggins is the supervisor, and then we have Neil Puckett, Franklin H. Price, Melissa Price, Nicholas Yarbrough, and myself, all pictured on the right here. Um, so for those of you unfamiliar with how the bureaucracy works, uh, we start with Governor DeSantis and the uh, greater state of Florida in body. We then drop down to the Florida Department of State headed by Secretary Lee. We then go to the Division of Historical Resources headed by Tim Parsons, and then we come to the Florida Bureau of Archaeological Research, and then we go into the Florida Underwater Program, which I am a part of. Uh, so we have public, uh, BAR has four sections. We have public lands archaeology that manages over 8,400 square miles. We have underwater archaeology that manages over 12,000 square miles of water. We have collection that curates 3.5 million objects, and we have conservation that works to keep everything moving and flowing, and especially maintaining those objects and collections. Uh, so BAR was established under Chapter 267 of the Florida Statutes, and we're tasked with the ones you see on the left here. So essentially, we are a regulating, managing, protection, and research agency. Um, we're responsible for a lot of uh, permitting, we try and assist other agencies in managing archaeological research, and we also perform our own research. Uh, so the reason we matter is because all archaeology on state lands belongs to the state of Florida. Uh, we have over 35,000 total archaeological sites, as you can see on that map there. Eight, over 8,400 total square miles of state lands. Um, and the statute statute requires us to perform regulatory supervision and research efforts. So specifically when it comes to uh, underwater, Florida has the second greatest amount of coastline of any US state, uh, just below Alaska, of over 84,000 miles. We have the third greatest amount of water by area, over 12,000 square miles. All navigable waterways or inland waterways as I sometimes refer to them in Florida also belong to the state. We manage the waters three miles into the Atlantic and nine miles into the Gulf, nine nautical miles. And we have just under 300 confirmed offshore sites. And less than 1% of our, of our state waters is surveyed for historical and archeological purposes. 
So there's new stuff popping up all of the time. This is a quick diagram kind of showing you the division of, of waters. Uh, as it starts from the mean high water mark, we go into what's here called submerged lands. So we end right at this line here, and from there it becomes federal waters. The BAR is infrastructure and equipment. We manage a fleet of research vessels. We have remote sensing equipment and software. We have scuba equipment, which includes underwater communications and manage an archeological diving program. We have excavation equipment that you can picture here. This is an underwater dredge that operates very similar to a vacuum that is going up to two or three vessels at the surface with two of our divers working right there. We work very hard to maintain and repair most of our gear in-house to keep costs down. And we also manage a fleet or a collection of video and photo gear, which you can see me modeling in that picture there. Uh, so our past projects, just to give you an idea of what we've done before, are the uh, museums in the sea. Uh, you might also have seen this uh, as the Florida Shipwreck Trail sometimes. But these are archaeological preserves around Florida. We currently have 11 of them, but we're continuing to expand them. Uh, that's been a program that started in 1987 and has run all the way through the present. Sorry, my computer has decided to select all kinds of things. There we go. Uh, the Osceola River. Uh, in recent years, we've provided assistance with Franklin Price there and him modeling a bone pin found there. Uh, the Chattahoochee landing wrecks um, on the uh, mouth of the Apalachicola River just south of the Florida Georgia border uh, have been visited in 2010 and 2017. Marker 39 is one of our assessment projects that was completed in 2009. Um, and one of your board members, Brendan Ackerman, is actually modeling there on the left uh, with myself on the right as we recover uh, a canoe from the Avon Park Air Force bombing range last year. Recent projects include Minnesota Key Offshore, which is a seven to 8,000 year old prehistoric graveyard um, that we are currently still excavating. It also includes the Robo or French shipwrecks off Canaveral, which you can see pictured here with the fleur de lis on one of the cannons uh, shown in its or visible during the initial discovery phase. Fort Gadsden, um, also referred to in histories as Negro Fort, um, has requested that. We do some remote servicing, uh, remote sensing in the river offshore, which we were going to do just before Michael, and then recovery efforts canceled that, and we're still waiting to see when we'll be able to go out. Uh, one of our primary outreach projects include the Florida Panhandle Shipwreck Trail. Um, these include artificial reefs and historic wrecks uh, that we promote and make extremely accessible to the public through partnering with local dive shops and the distribution of online videos, uh, diving passports, and other qualifications. Um, and more recent, uh, and throughout, throughout Florida, we help assist, manage, and perform canoe recoveries and documentation, as you can see with the two canoe parts uh, photographed inside of a U-Haul here. Uh, so we're gonna move on to Dog Island now. So Dog Island, for those of you that don't know, is pictured right here. It sits just south of Carabel, with the Carabel River running right there and coming out into the bay. That little bit of land that you see right there um, is St. George Island. Dog Island is the easternmost uh, barrier island in a set of three that consists of Dog Island, St. George Island, and St. Vincent. Uh, it is a sandy barrier island, meaning that it is continuously shifting. Its sands are always moving, uh, and generally speaking, the sands are, or the island is elongating itself, so getting longer from east to west, roughly, and is moving closer and closer to the mainland. Uh, it suffers heavily under extreme weather events, uh, like Hurricane Michael, and we'll get to that in more detail in a little bit. Uh, so this map is a geo-referenced image of the shifting nature of Dog Island, where the most recent, or 2013, image is the pink overlay. You can see that the island has started to move a little bit more to the east and, and started to elongate itself towards the, uh, the mainland there. And you can see something similar here on the west. Also note that the shoreline, where you can see my mouse moving there, is currently much further inland than it originally was from the 1900 uh, map that was used here. 
So this is an image of, her, uh, of, of the island and the shipwreck location just before Hurricane Michael hit. Uh, note the pier here, note this little box here, and uh, in particular note that there is no water on top of any of that sand. So we'll shift now to an image of just after Hurricane Michael. Um, so you can see the pier has been slightly covered by sand here. Um, you can see that the sand has been completely blown away. The shoreline is no longer a straight line. Uh, there's little water pockets originating everywhere. You can see in particular, um, of course, why we're all here today are these two shipment fra uh, shipwreck fragments. So this is the one that in the presentation today, I will be referring to as the bow fragment or bow structure. And the one over here, I will be referring to as the hull fragment or hull structure. And what you see is this rectangular image here is a collection of pilings that when I talk to the local property owner um, is a uh, location of an old house that they then moved. You, uh, you can't see it in this image, but when it's low tide, you can actually see a concrete um, septic tank that is still located within those pilings. Uh, there was initial thought that it might have been a dock that the island had moved over or a historic war for something like that, but unfortunately that structure coupled with those artifacts seems to uh, not bear that conclusion out. So a brief history of Dog Island. Uh, in 1733, we have its first mention as Ile aux Chênes, or Isle of Dogs in French, uh, on a French map. You can see that map pictured here, and you can see Ile aux Chênes here. Uh, we speculate that this is the Apalachicola River here. Uh, this is probably the St. Mark's and uh, Wakala rivers coming together there. And you can see these other islands joining here. Uh, with the shifting nature of the islands, it's entirely possible that there, uh, that the bay here, that it was so shallow here that they perceived this to be a peninsula. Uh, at this time uh, in 1733, the French are colonizing Mobile, Alabama. Uh, and competing with the Spanish uh, in Pensacola. So this area is heavily trafficked and heavily uh, cartographed or mapped because the first person to chart it is often the first person to claim it. So there was a continued uh, race to chart and claim land in this area. Um, additionally, once uh, Spain established dominance in Florida, they speculate that this area or the three barrier islands there were used heavily by smugglers and pirates to hide out. Uh, while there is no fresh water source that I know of on Dog Island, uh, the river nearby um, in Carabel provides an adequate source. It's sheltered uh, and quite pleasant there. Um, so, and it's off of the most of the major trade routes, which means that they can uh, hide out there without, without, uh, without the risk of continuous uh, ships passing by. In 1776, there is the Le Tigre that goes down there. Uh, this is a mythical ship that supposedly carries treasure. Uh, Mel Fisher even came up, uh, Mel Fisher, a notorious treasure hunter from the Mel Fisher Museum in the Keys, came up and uh, surveyed the area looking for it, uh, but found nothing. There is no exact location known for this shipwreck yet. Uh, HMS Fox is related to Augustus Bowles, uh, pictured here where uh, they had, or he, he claimed to have knowledge of the area, uh, guided a ship in and it wrecked and they spent the night and were eventually rescued. Uh, from 1800 to 1860, this area of Florida uh, is heavily reliant upon trade. Um, in particular, uh, the Carabelle River, the Apalachicola River, uh, and any other inland waterways provide access to uh, inland Florida and inland Georgia. Uh, and they allow the communities there to bring their commodities like cotton, like timber, and anything else that they're growing to seaside ports like Apulachicola and Carabelle and other smaller regional ports, uh, and to then ship them all over the world. Um, the reason I end this at 1860 is because of the Civil War, but towards the 1850s and 60s, the advent of the railroad has started to diminish this trade as the railroad becomes the principal mover of commodities uh, from inland to ports like Savannah, Jacksonville, or Pensacola. Uh, and that was simply a more efficient, cheaper way to bring, uh, to bring those goods to market. Uh, so from 1861 to 1865, uh, we have the Civil War. Uh, there is heavy blockading activity around this area as these small harbors, rivers, 
uh, in little swamp areas provided excellent hidey holes for, uh, for smugglers and blockade runners. We have several uh, reported wreckings of Civil War uh, ships in, excuse me, uh, in and around Dog Island. Uh, both Union and Confederate troops were based on Dog Island. Uh, the lighthouse that was built there in the 1840s or 50s was destroyed uh, and shot at by both parties for fear of it being used as a lookout. Um, but there is no major engagement fought anywhere near the, uh, the island. Uh, from 1865 to 1930, lumber and seafood, um, and I should say naval stores as well, um, become the dominant driving economic force in the region. Uh, so pictured here is the dock in Apalachicola, um, and you have, j uh, sorry, not jars, but barrels of pine resin, a crucial uh, ingredient in the construction and maintenance of wooden ships, uh, stored and ready for delivery or shipping there. Um, as you know, driving through Apalachicola's uh, state forest and other nearby areas, pine grows very well here. Pine is heavily used in the construction of wooden ships. Um, and both the lumber and products resulting from the trees were used in its construction. This made this region particularly valuable as European timber stores started to dwindle and they had to turn to a global market to, um, excuse me, to uh, maintain their merchant and Navy fleets. Uh, and one particular event of note during this time is the 1899 hurricane that we'll come back to. Uh, with a picture. Uh, and this kind of continues until the Great Depression. Uh, after the or during the Great Depression, we see some decline in the seafood industry. Um, and that has the seafood industry, along with lumber, has continued to be a major driver in the area. Uh, but unfortunately for the lumber industry, uh, the ports of Carabao, or the port of Carabao in particular, but most of this region does not ship directly anymore. Uh, from 1941 to 1945, there obviously America gets involved in World War II. Dog Island has a bombing range attached to it uh, or in the water near it. Um, there is a small camp there associated with the bombing range and a training camp yard uh, for infantry. Uh, the entire area in this part of the state was also used to practice amphibious landings, um, particularly practice for landings like D Day. Uh, there are, in fact, several landing craft wrecked in the uh, in the bay, and if you are interested in something like that, um, there is a small museum in Caribou called the Camp Johnson uh, World War II Museum or Camp Gordon World War II Museum, and I would definitely recommend visiting that if you uh, want to see some interesting artifacts from the time. Uh, so pictured after those naval stores, we see small fishing fleets heading out here with either uh, a little tug or a little pleasure craft in the foreground here. Uh, and this picture shows the aftermath of the 1899 hurricane that struck Dog Island. Uh, labeled are wrecks based off of uh, mapping and identified features. For instance, if you zoom in right there, you can see Mary E. Morse on the stern of that vessel. Uh, and from there we can, in other pictures, we've been able to figure out which ships are which. Uh, you have several American vessels, you have some Norwegian vessels, you have some unknown wrecks. Uh, I, I believe in total um, it was just under 20 big ships that wrecked on Dog Island uh, and somewhere between four and seven were left or abandoned on the island because they were deemed too uh, damaged to refloat and return to port for repairs. Almost all of these ships were uh, inland of Dog Island and had sheltered there for the storm. But they would have been in the area to pick up lumber ships almost or to pick up lumber stores almost exclusively. Uh, so moving on to the archaeology of Dog Island. Uh, the, there is some limited archaeology before 1995, but no uh, large-scale surveys. The first survey is in 1995, which is a terrestrial survey with some smaller maritime components carried out um, by Nancy White. Uh, in 1999 and 2002, the program of underwater archaeology at FSU, uh, headed first by Chuck Mead in 99, and then by Chris Harrell and uh, his wife, or his now wife, uh, Melanie Damour, uh, survey and remote sense all around Dog Island. 
Uh, they locate several ships. Um, the one pictured here uh, on the right is the Priscilla, which you will find under uh, Dog Island Shipwreck Number One if you're in the Florida Master Sci-Fi. Uh, they also locate several smaller features, uh, including Dog Island Shipwreck Number Two, and they even locate the wreck of the Norwegian bark Vala right there. Um, they suspect off of this picture that the Yafnahar and some of the other ones that were abandoned there are also buried under Dog Island, but were simply not found yet. Uh, so in 2012 and 2018, BAR visits the island. They visit the same wreck, which is Dog Island Shipwreck number three. Um, it is FR1284 in the Florida Master Site file. At the time, uh, this was a call from a November storm that occurred in 2017. Uh, and it completely uncovered the shipwreck. And by the time we got there, just two weeks later, the entire shipwreck was filled in again, as you can see here. Um, so we are this, when I take this photo, um, I am actually standing on top of the wreck. Uh, it is buried under a few feet of sand, but this is all that's poking out. Um, and these are the ends of ship, frame, or ship frames or ribs um, that are poking out of the sand there. Um, and you can see an iron fastener coming out of one of the timbers right there. Uh, Hurricane Michael obviously struck, um, and really this is the focus of the talk. So it washed up two shipwrecks. We have the bow fragment pictured here. Um, this also stimulated BAR to continue surveying off Dog Island. Um, the shifting geography and nature of the bottom sediment there means that wrecks and other archaeological material or sites um, and features are continuously exposed, re-exposed, uh, or exposed for the first time. Uh, such a changing environment means that one sustained uh, remote sensing job like the one that occurred in 1999 and 2002 is simply not enough. Uh, in 20 years, we don't know what's changed. We don't know what's exposed. We don't know what's been washed up. Um, so with that in mind, we ran a trial run of six uh, remote sensing lanes uh, and located several um, features. Uh, right over here is the Dog Island Lighthouse that is buried uh, or that is submerged now. Uh, and that also aptly demonstrates the movement of Dog Island. This was built in the middle of the island as per reports of the time. And obviously now it lies in about 20 feet of water in approximately 100 to 200 yards offshore. Just for your own reference points, um, this block right here where you see these pink, blue, green, and red dots, that is where uh, the Hurricane Michael shipwrecks ended up washing up. The house that we saw is right here. And this bunch of yellow dots here uh, marks the original or marks the location of Dog Island shipwreck number three, which in 2018 was identified as the Jafnahar, which was one of the Norwegian wrecks um, or lumber ships that washed up and was destroyed and abandoned in the 1899 hurricane. The dots you see within these magnetic contours uh, represent magnetic signatures that I've tagged for further investigations along with side sonar scan or side scan sonar hits. Um, unfortunately, the resolution on, on those when I shipped them over didn't translate well to the PowerPoint and I apologize for that. Um, but in one of these lanes about right here, we actually found a, um, a ship timber shaped like a V uh, or I suspect it's a ship timber or potentially another hull fragment sticking up out of the sand. Uh, we had the lighthouse over here, um, and there's a couple of other smaller debris fields over here that uh, still warrant further investigation because they're associated with a, uh, a large magnetic contour here. There's one here, uh, and there's one small one over here that needs investigating as well. Uh, so the maritime archaeology of Dog Island, uh, and specifically I should uh, specify this is the eastern end of Dog Island, or sorry, I'm sorry, western end of Dog Island, um, and this is uh, where the documented locations of the uh, current known shipwreck. So we have Dog Island shipwreck number three, which in 2018 was identified by BAR as the Vala. We have Dog Island shipwreck number one, which was recognized uh, by Chuck Mead as the in 1999 as the uh, Priscilla or a uh, fishing yacht or sloop and Dog Island Shipwreck number two here is the uh, Vala which is the another one of the Norwegian ships that excuse me 
that wrecked during the 1899 hurricane. Uh, we also have Ballast Cove shipwrecks. Um, so Ballast Cove is one of the coves on the northern end or northern side of the island. We have a couple of shipwrecks or uh, sh um, we have a couple of shipwrecks or potential uh, shipwreck signatures further offshore. And now, of course, we have the Hurricane Michael shipwrecks. Uh, I'm working to finalize that report and it will make its way into the Florida Master Site Fund. Uh, so, uh, Hurricane Michael hits, uh, as we just said, about two years ago. Uh, within four or five days, we have pictures showing up on Facebook from the Caribou Boat Club of shipwrecks on Dog Island. Um, this on the left here is one of the shipwrecks that was posted. BAR was contacted by the Caribou History Museum. Uh, and unfortunately, due to travel uh, restraints put upon us by the bureaucracy, we were not able to make it out until January of 20. Uh, excuse me, of 2019 with a recurrent visit in November of 2019 as well. So on the left here, you see them very recently after being washed off, you see that hull fragment that I was talking about right here with some frames sticking out. Uh, and you see that group of pilings that I uh, was talking about. And that structure right in the middle there is that se uh, suspected septic tank that I was mentioning. Um, over there in the distance, you see the hull fragment and I have further close-up shots appearing later. Uh, but you can see that the hull fragment is resting on top of these pilings. It is no longer on those pilings, I should add. It is now moved about uh, 80 to 100 meters further north and west and is laying on the sand approximately in the middle of the island. So further storms or further wave action from laying in that surf zone and getting continuously beat eventually shifted it further up the island. Uh, the bow fragment is also now further towards the middle of the island as per our latest GPS uh, coordinates. You can also see here that it is a spot, popular visiting spot for uh, local boaters, tourists, and um, like uh, I still get uh, complaints from the property owner that the, the shipwreck draws tons of crowds. They're obviously very interesting, but I, in case you want to visit these, I should remind you that they are on private property. Uh, and to treat access as such. You can see these from the shore and you can anchor offshore and, and witness them that way. Um, but I know that the uh, property owner will appreciate you not stepping onto his property. Um, we also have a bow segment pictured here. Uh, the black stuff you see here is not burning marks. Um, it's actually a kind of uh, glue or uh, pitch that's put down to atta help attach and waterproof the ship and help attach these months or, or copper plate or months metal plates at the bottom here. Um, and at the front, the reason this looks a little different is because we suspect that's lead sheeting. Unfortunately, by the time BAR archeologists got there, it was too buried uh, to access, so we couldn't verify that. Uh, but you can see there's some hull planking surviving. We, this is the bow structure right here. Um, we had what looked like a spar in the picture. This unfortunately it washed out. There's some iron knees within there, um, and there's a whole keel structure within that as well. Um, so the question became, what do we want to know? Uh, we want to know when did the ship sink, so how old is it? We want to know when it was built. We want to know where it was from. We want to know why it was built. Uh, we want to know why it was here. In short, we want to know what ship is it. Uh, now, I should emphasize for those of you unfamiliar with archaeology or maritime archaeology in particular, it is extremely difficult to make a definitive uh, uh, identity call on a ship or in any shipwreck. Unless you find the ship's bell or something else with the ship's name on it, um, you basically start relying on historical records and any other historical and archaeological evidence that you can find to get you as close as possible to identifying the ship. Uh, so the rest of this presentation is going to look at some clues that we found on the shipwrecks themselves that kind of help narrow down the timeline. We obviously know the location of the wreck and we assume it hasn't moved too much from its original wrecking location. So we can look at uh, wrecking events of that era. We can look at associated archeological sites and eventually we'll build up to an identity. Uh, so initial clues include the presence of Munts metal. Uh, you see a fall, small fragment of that here. Uh, so for those of you uh, familiar with ship construction, you'll know that uh, Monts metal is a type of sheeting. It was an, uh, initially used as a, uh, where it was, copper was initially used to sheet ships. And the reason it's on there is because copper is poisonous to marine life. 
uh, before the advent of copper sheathing, um, lots and lots of marine life like barnacles, seaweed would trail off of shipwreck hulls and slow them down. Um, this obviously would cost time, it would cost money, it made sailing very efficient, it made maintaining ships that much more difficult. Uh, copper was an effective solution, but it was also a very expensive solution. Uh, Mr. Muntz invented Muntz metal in the 1830s. He mixes copper with zinc, and there are other mixtures that appear a, a little later. Uh, he patents the metal. It is uh, two thirds of the cost. It weighs less. It is easily affordable. It is very malleable, and it performs exactly the same purpose with no um, recognizable uh, decrease in performance from the copper. Uh, we have copper fasteners pictured here. You see one, a copper or Munz metal fastener with the head right there. Um, now, it was very difficult to get a good picture of uh, the head of any of these fasteners. Uh, and when I say fasteners, in this case, this is a giant nail going through a, a two to three inch plank, through a timber or through a frame that's about nine inches thick, and then um, potentially out the other side as well, which is through another two to three inch plank. Um, but the reason I point out the heads here um, is because the heads look very machined. Um, they weren't hammered. Uh, you can see there's no real splitting along the side, so they weren't put in there as a rod and hammered. There was some other tool that was used to make them almost appear like a round rivet. Uh, this indicates later construction. Uh, along with the Munz metal gives us a date of a, a date after which the ship would have been constructed. So we know that Munz metal became available in the 1830s wasn't widely adopted until the 1840s or 50s, but it was used throughout wooden ship construction. So we can speculate that the shipwreck belongs in the later half of the 19th century. Uh, charred timbers were another clue, potential clue. Uh, the ends of the timbers, as pictured uh, here, appear to have been burned and charred. Um, now this could mean that if we look through the historical records and we find evidence uh, or a record of ships that are burned, uh, that that would narrow down the identity. Not every ship burns, um, and not um, every abandoned shipwreck is burnt either. Uh, so we can narrow it down that way. But we should also bear in mind that ships that are abandoned or um, calculated as total losses after being beached in, in a hurricane or anything like that could also be burned uh, to minimize obstruction to navigation or minimize obstruction to a visual line of sight. A final um, clue was the presence of concrete. Um, this was very hard to picture because it was actually under about two to three inches of water at the time, but there is some concrete um, in the bow structure. Now I currently, I suspect that this is used as a permanent form of ballast. Uh, I have not found any academic journals that have said anything like this, uh, but I will address this a little bit more once we get to the identity of the ship. So these were initial clues that we saw upon the arrival, um, you know, immediate visual clues that give us something like this. We can differentiate Munts metal from copper, we can see these charred timbers, and we can see the concrete. Uh, our next step was to get scantling measurements, and when I, I say scantling, of the dimensions of different timbers. So we have frames here. We have what I will refer to as ceiling or inner planking here. We have hull planking on the outside here. And we have a keel running or a keel assembly running there. All of these are key diagnostic features. Um, and shipping is just like any other industry, um, especially in the later half of the 19th century. Big insurance. Uh, Companies have been built up, the most famous being Lloyd's in London, which has offices all over. There's American insurance companies as well. And these insurance companies put forward uh, construction minimum requirements. Uh, so it's just like if you built a house or you built a boat today or you have your car, uh, there are certain minimum standards that, you're, that any of these things need to abide by if they want to be insured. So. Based off that, we targeted several things. We have the keelson. Um, so the keel is the part of the ship that, or is the center timber of the ship that runs the entire line or length of the ship, but it sticks out a little bit at the bottom, or it can stick out a little bit at the bottom. Within the ship, you have a keelson, which is a timber that is put next to and around the keel to give extra structural support in that area. 
This became more and more prevalent the later in history you get or the more closer to our present time you get because big trees started to become really rare. So you couldn't cut massive keels anymore. You had to go and cut smaller keel soons and build up your keel structure within the ship itself. Uh, so these were 14 inches. Um, they were, the hull planking was measured at just under four inches thick on average. The frames were about 10 and a half by 10 and a half inches on either side. And the ceiling was four to six or the ceiling planking, which was, again was the inner planking, uh, was 4.6 inches thick. Uh, here you see a picture of this keelson with uh, what would have been a post hole there. Um, so you can see this, there's a keelson running here. There is one on the other side of it here that's not in the picture. And there is another keelson sitting right here. And the keel is actually directly under this th timber right here. Uh, we have hull planking that you can kind of see poking out underneath here. We have frames that are poking out underneath here. Uh, this is a modern steel wire that became entangled in the wreck. Uh, it is not associated with the actual uh, wreck or not contemporarily associated with the wreck. Uh, again, you see that Keelson structure here that's kind of letting go. Uh, you can see it's made of several pieces of timber. Uh, this is a better picture of the ceiling planking that you see here, along with some other frames that are poking out in the bulkhead construction. Uh, and the concrete I mentioned earlier, you might be able to see some of it poking out right there, but a lot of it can be seen in that front of that bulkhead structure. And all of these uh, measurements point, uh, or when compared to the you know, minimum construction standards of the American record of uh, domestic and foreign shipping, uh, point to a ship that is four to 600 tons in weight. Uh, and this is of the time they are referring to displacement tons. Uh, so the amount of water it displaces, not the amount it can carry, and not the amount that the ship itself weighs. I just wanna make that clear in case there's any confusion. Uh, so that's the bow structure. So we have uh, a ship from the later half of the 19th century, um, probably closer to the later quarter in the 19th century when we include the heavily machined parts that were visible. Uh, and uh, we have one that is between four and 600 tons. So we'll compare those figures to our historical record and hopefully come up with an identity. Now the hull fragment is a little difficult. Um, so it's between, or the hull planking, as you can see here, is uh, five and a half inches thick on average, uh, which depending on which part of the hull we're looking at, is anywhere between an 800 to 2,000 ton vessel. Unfortunately, this didn't narrow down our search parameters enough for me to come up with a conclusive identity. So from this point forward, when I talk about the identity of the shipwreck, I'm talking about the identity of the bow fragment, uh, which we just looked at. Uh, and when I say which part of the hull, uh, I mean, so obviously the hull starts at the keel and builds up like this. There are different requirements depending on how far up the structure you are. It gets, it starts very thick, gets a little thinner, then there's another thick part right where it, it turns and then it gets narrower as it gets to the very top. Um, but without further study and potentially some excavation in this case, we'll not figure out which part of the ship this is. And we won't really uh, be able to conclusively identify this in any uh, meaningful way. Um, again, I, I mentioned that the ship had moved or the hull fragment had moved. So here on the left, in the lower left corner, you see it lying on that vault or on, that pi on those pilings again. And here on the right, you see it in what is now more or less its present location as well. Uh, to give you a visual, over on the right there, those little dots there, 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 and there, um, those are the pilings uh, now submerged under the incoming tide. Um, and you can see there's been some damage from the storm with this timber poking or this frame poking up through the hull uh, planking there uh, that was not there before. Um, before we before it moved. So our final conclusions are that we have a bow fragment, from, a bow fragment and a hull fragment from the later 19th century. In the case of the bow fragment, we have a ship that is between four and 600 displacement tons. We have its proximity to shipwreck sites. This location was about 300 meters from the sh uh, Dog Island shipwreck number three that we had investigated in 2018 and showed a very similar uh, construction 
uh, to that ship or to that shipwreck. Um, and that was conclusively identified as the Yafnahar. So we felt comfortable uh, saying that this was one of close to that similar time period as well. Um, so that narrowed it down to the later quarter of the 19th century. Uh, it's mostly wood construction, which comes into play when we do our historical search. Um, so the question remains, what ship is it? Uh, introducing to you the Yafnahar. Now we initially saw the Yafnahar um, in that picture of the 1899 hurricane. It was wrecked to the left of that image uh, and away uh, from, uh, from some of the other wrecks. It is a 476 ton Norwegian bark. Uh, now I should mention bark does not have any indication on what the hull shape is. It is simply a type of rigging uh, on a ship. So you can see here it had three masts. Uh, this is it pictured um, in, the in the late 19th century picking up a load of lumber. Uh, this is taken from a, a Norwegian library or archive. Um, and it simply talks about how the sails and, and lines on the ship are arranged. It does not necessarily have any indication on the construction of the ship. Um, it functioned primarily as a lumber ship. And what I mean by that, it is it traveled the world to pick up uh, lumber. Norwegians built and used wooden ships uh, well into the 20th century. Uh, they were in fact famous for it. Uh, this particular ship, the Afnahar, was built in Korsgrun in, in Norway in 1877. It was 130 feet long at its longest point. It was uh, just under 30 feet wide at the uh, widest point and it measured a depth of 16 feet. Um, and it was wrecked and abandoned and potentially burned in the 1899 hurricane. So this ship, um, when coupled with the archeological analysis that we saw before, it is one of uh, the only ships in, of that time period that would have wrecked in that general area or in this general area. Um, it is, very close to where the Vala is wrecked. Uh, and it is entirely possible that her events like Hurricane Michael and even events like Tropical Storm Nestor that came through in November or any other major weather events uh, shifted that wreck that we identified in 2018 um, about 300 meters uh, or 400 meters to the east to its current location. Uh, and in fact, uh, to put icing on the cake, the local property owner sent us a couple of drone shots. So on the left here, you see Dog Island Shipwreck number three, uh, identified as Yafnahar in 2018, in its original location, about 300 meters further west, where it lays now. Um, and this is a drone shot of the same wreck just after Hurricane Michael. And there's a couple visual clues that we can look at. So both of these ships have iron knees. You can see them poking there. And iron knees are like big L brackets that they use in ships that attach directly to the hull structure or to a frame and support any uh, decks above or below it. Uh, you can see those there. There is one lying right there. But pay special attention to that bow structure there. That bulkhead is the exact same, even down to the part of the uh, stem post that is poking up and away from the rest of the structure. There's also similarities in the planking and in the frames that are poking out. Now the big difference in these two is this hull fragment that is broken off. So you can see there is an intact hull or side of the hull there, uh, but unfortunately that's broken off. Uh, I cannot conclusively say that that is the same hull fragment that washed up. It is potentially that, but I would need to look at both of these wrecks and compare them to previous measurements in more closer detail uh, to make a conclusive uh, call on something like that. A gr another great indicator for us um, in 2018 was the presence of iron rigging. Uh, now we found, unfortunately by this time it had washed away, but I had received photographs and reports of iron rigging components lying around this ship as well. Um, so that allowed us to identify this ship as the Yafnahar. It had simply moved three to 400 meters uh, during Hurricane Michael. Uh, so I'm just gonna wind up here. This is the last, last few slides. So a couple of the threats uh, to the site. So we have looting damage. 
So you might be able to easily identify in this picture a copper or Munce metal fastener. You can see it's all shiny there. And if you look really closely, you can either see, even see the striations of a coping saw that was used to cut the end of that fastener uh, and for somebody to take home a nice souvenir. Now, um, first of all, this is illegal. Uh, <laughs> recovering anything from state-owned archeological resources is illegal and uh, can be punished in various ways. Um, but more than that, it diminishes the site. And it, in this case, it uh, could irreversibly damage the structural integrity of the site. The more fasteners are removed, the less, uh, excuse me, uh, the uh, less uh, robust the ship becomes. Um, so if you see anybody uh, taking things off the ship, if you're visiting, please tell them and inform them that they shouldn't and just to leave it alone. That's usually our best defense. FWC is occasionally in the area and is aware of the wrecks and we have posted signs around there in cooperation with the local property owner. Uh, the other one is surf or weather damage. Uh, so I mentioned before that there was a timber sticking out of that hull fragment. You see that uh, pictured here. So this is likely a floor timber or one of the first timbers in what, what the rib structure of the ship is. Uh, it's poking out through the hull there and you can see where the hull planks have broken. Um, and you can see where some trunnels have broken off as well. Um, and this is all the result of weather and is basically totally unavoidable until these ships uh, find an environmental equilibrium that uh, maintains them as archeological resource. Exposure damage is another one. Um, so for anybody with, a, uh, with any wooden things sitting outside in Florida, you know that the sun wreaks havoc on anything like that. Uh, this becomes worse when the, water, when the wood is waterlogged. So when wood becomes completely saturated with water, the water actually replaces some of the cellular structure of the, uh, of the wood. And when it starts to dry out, the wood will literally crumble and fall apart. Uh, now you see that process starting here where some of the uh, ship is starting to dry out around this, uh, this post hole right here. Um, should that continue, the ship will literally just fall apart. Uh, that being said, the continuous exposure and re-exposure to a dry environment from a wet environment and back again is also detrimental to the ship because it will continue this bad cycle of drying out and getting wet again, drying out and getting wet again. For this archaeological resource to survive, we need it to find itself in a uh, continuous and sustained uh, environment so that it can maintain a sort of status quo or environmental and biological and chemical balance with everything. Uh, and then we already discussed weather. Uh, some future efforts on the site included include a grant that we have submitted to the Florida Coastal Management Program for uh, a more extensive remote sensing uh, program in and around the island. Uh, we have continued remote sensing regardless. We have continued monitoring. Uh, I was able to build a partnership with the Carabelle History Museum and several local um, I refer to them as informants. That does not mean that they do bad things uh, or are cheating on anybody or anything like that. Uh, they're simply telling me how the ships are doing. Uh, and we also have, uh, so we have the Carabelle History Museum there. And we also have the continued presence of washed up timbers. So I kind of alluded to these earlier. Uh, this was one that washed up in McCassick Beach, uh, which if you look at a map of Dog Island and St. George and you find the channel, and then you go straight inland, that's where McCassick Beach is. So there is a possibility that this timber originated from one of the shipwrecks on or around Dog Island. Unfortunately, it's uh, the material associated with that timber is not conclusive enough for me to identify it as anything other than a ship, ship timber at this point. I need to have a closer look at some of the fasteners and dimensions and construction techniques on there, but I can't do that until uh, one, after COVID goes away and two after I uh, talk to the conservation lab. Uh, so just some final acknowledgements and thank you. Uh, thank you to you guys, the Tallahassee Historical Society for letting me talk about this. I love talking about underwater archeology. span um, Thanks to the Carabelle History Museum for forming a partnership with me. Uh, Frank Stephenson and Rod Gashi are two of the uh, informants that I mentioned earlier. 
I'd also like Dan Osley, who has been a contact point on the island and has helped us post signs. Um, I'd like to uh, thank the FWC that's located in Carabel for helping us monitor and police the shipwrecks. Uh, and finally, thank you to the staff with Be Air Underwater that let me drag them out on cold weather days uh, to sit on a sandy, windy island as we got buffeted by uh, cold water and waves. Uh, but that's it. So I can open up the Q&A now. I'll open that up a little bit more. Uh, if you guys want to enter your questions there, or if there's a different way that we want to do this, I can end my sharing as well. Before you, um, before you start taking questions, uh, this isn't that the coolest thing everybody ever saw. I mean, that's just so neat, and I still want to go out there. I might say, I mm. might say that. I want to thank you for very much for this presentation, and because um, because he has given the first virtual talk to our historical society, it is only fitting that we present him with the first virtual Tallahassee Historical Society travel <laughs> mug. Thank uh, you. <laughs> I'm kidding, actually, these have been stored down in the Martin House for the last seven months and nobody's been able to get to them. So we will make it, uh, we will make it Brandon's uh, obligation to uncover the box and put one of these on, on your desk. I guess you have a desk down yeah. there. Yeah, if he puts it there, that's perfect, thank you and get one to you so <laughs> that's perfect thank you so much sure sure i will mute myself and let questions come in how about that sure thing. i think i see there's a couple of hand raises uh in the attendees uh i don't see anything in the q a box uh right now so I'll, and i don't see anything in the chat so please make sure to put any questions in there um and if any of the panelists have questions they're obviously free to unmute themselves and ask anything well, I'll ask something. I'll go first. I don't mind being rude and interrupting with every, with, I, I am assuming from everything that you showed that these were all sailing vessels. Is that right? Is there any indication that they were powered by steam or anything? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, so as far as I can tell, these are all sailing vessels. Um, there's no record of the Yafnahar being powered by steam at any point. Um, that is not uncommon in the later 19th century. Um, steam started to become viable for oceanic transport just before the Civil War and really took off after the, the American Civil War. Um, I'm sorry, it seems that the Q&A box might not be working. Uh, so if you put your questions in the chat, I'll make sure to monitor there. I see uh, one person already and I'll get to that question in a second. Uh, but yeah, steam didn't become viable, and then you needed a bigger logistical support for that because you needed little coaling stations to refill your steam. Uh, and the Norwegians uh, were one of the few European powers that could still build wooden ships and wooden sailing ships as well and maintain them. So they opted to go that route. Um, and in some cases, sailing ships are better and faster and a better option than, than steam ships. But that's a whole other presentation um, that I can... Uh, get into. Uh, let me make sure I have the Q&A open. Perfect. Uh, so just in the chat and then I'll get to the ones uh, there. Uh, so there was a survey completed in 1995 um, by Nancy White. Uh, it, the question was, for those of you who can't see it, is amazing that there was not a survey of the island before and around 2000. Um, so there was some archaeology performed there in the 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, and then it really took off in the 90s. Uh, now part of that is because of the construction on the island. Um, it, it is required under Florida and federal law that you perform an archaeological survey before any construction, so that drives a lot of archaeological survey. Um, they did find a log boat there. They have found a World War II camp there. They found logging camps. Um, they've found um, some other prehistoric sites in that area as well. And a lot of that is actually located around the Dog Island Harbor to the eastern end of the island. Um, so the first question is from uh, Cindy Cosper. Uh, and I apologize if I mispronounce anybody's name. Uh, and she asks, uh, where else do you have wrecks moving on and offshore with islands rolling over? Um, so there's a couple of instances where this uh, has happened. 
there's uh, barrier islands uh, all up and down the Florida coast where this is happening or has happened. Um, what we also have um, is, uh, in certain cases, is the encroachment of a beach that ends up burying an island. Uh, in other cases, we have it occurring in rivers where silt builds up around the shipwreck and then moves, uh, um, and then moves that silt off the shipwreck and re-exposes it. So there's a lot of environmental factors that occur, uh, but it does occur all around the world. You just need that right from a combination of, of factors going on. Um, and then uh, J. Doug Smith asked, uh, what wood was used in the, in the construction of the vessel? So I wasn't, uh, I have not yet taken a uh, dendrochronological sample to ship off for identification. Uh, however, I can tell you that most ocean going ships would have been constructed of oak and uh, the masts and other fragments would have been constructed of pine. Now, this late in, in the 19th century, it is possible that other wood types would have been used. But given that both of these types are prevalent in or present in Norway and were harvested specifically uh, for shipbuilding, I would assume it's one of those two, but I haven't conclusively uh, and scientifically identified the wood samples yet. Uh, that's on the list for that grant uh, or will be on the list for that grant eventually. Um, and then Claude Kennison asks, uh, did the French find a colony of dogs there when they explored there? Um, that's a good question. Nobody knows why it's called Dog Island. Um, as far as we know, there was no, um, uh, no, I'm sorry. Um, there was no um, dogs there. There was, there's no fresh water for them to maintain themselves there. Uh, we think it might have to do with the shape of the island as it was perceived by the French, but that's just a theory. Um, maybe their dog was just really happy when they got ashore there and that's then they decided to name it after that. Uh, I see there's some some other questions in the chat. Give me just one second. Uh, are there par plans for parts of the wrecks to go to museums? Um, so of the shipwrecks that we discussed that are on Dog Island, um, we're not going to start breaking them apart or anything uh, and shipping those off to museums. And unfortunately, those are way too large for us to conserve either in-house and if we do it out of house, it's gonna be extremely expensive. Um, that um, involves years and years of treatment um, to resaturate the wood with something other than water so it doesn't break apart. And then you have to maintain and conserve the metal components within there. Um, and it gets very, very pricey and is a very, very long-term endeavor. And there is just simply nobody there or nobody yet that has expressed an interest in doing that for these shipwrecks. Uh, to give you an example of how rare that is, um, if you look at something like the Mary Rose in England that was recovered in the 1960s or 70s, or the Vasa in Sweden was recovered in the 1960s and 70s, and in some cases they're still spraying those down with a saturation agent. Um, so that's the kind of time limit you're, or timeline you're looking at. Uh, it's a continued effort. Um, they've been at it for over 40 years and to build something for these shipwrecks is currently not in the cards. Um, that being said, uh, some of those recovered timbers like the one that we talked about uh, or like those that we talked about that washed up kind of in line with that channel between uh, Dog and St. George Island, those uh, will be conserved at the Florida Conservation Lab, which is part of VAR, um, and will then be shipped to the Carabelle History Museum once they have a proper display case full. Um, and they have some historical imagery. They've done some local research as well to give that whole display a kind of local flavor. But even a timber like that could take a year or two before they see the uh, final product or something like that. Uh, let me just, and then I have another question here that, and I'm sorry, I can't see the uh, full names on, on these questions. Uh, is there more information about the pilings in the surf, the ones that had been believed to be a part of a dock, but using the house with a septic tank? Um, so there, I, I have found no archaeological or historical maps that indicate the presence of a dock in that area. Um, the, um, as each time we visited, the pilings have been in the middle of getting battered by incoming uh, waves and, and surf that was about three to four foot high, so we weren't able to get in there and take a good look at them. Um, that being said, the pilings 
uh, from what we were able to gather and how close we got, we could see that the pilings looked like modern treated timber, visually speaking, but we'd have to get a little closer to confirm that. Uh, one of the property owners or somebody who was familiar with that part of the island as well told me that they had moved the house from that piling location to its present location. Um, and that's really all I know about that house. I haven't been able to pull up any construction records or anything there yet. Uh, and I see that one theory is that Dog Island refers to sailors dropped off on the island when the ship made port so the sailors went up. Yes, that is uh, correct. Sailors were often referred to as dogs, and uh, all of these islands would have been nice little R and R spots that would allow the captains of ships to ensure that their uh, sailors didn't desert or swim away. Um, make sure. Um, and if that's all, is that everybody's questions? I don't see any in the Q and A, and the chat is. That's everybody from the chat. I have one more. Sure. You can always count on me for one more. Um, <laughs> do we know the oldest shipwreck associated with Dog Island? Okay, so when you say shipwreck, do you mean confirmed archaeological shipwreck or oldest shipwreck as in one that we have an archaeological record of? Boy, I don't know. Why don't you try both <laughs> of them? <laughs> um, so... <laughs> I we have some ballast piles around that might be older than these 1899 shipwrecks, but I can't think of any off the top of my head that we've conclusively identified. Um, I can pull up a list for you of uh, uh, wrecked ships, and the earliest documented one is in 1611, which is the Santa Ana Maria Yucal, uh, which is a Spanish ship, uh, and. Um, was lost somewhere in the region of Apalachicola, as it was defined by the Spanish at the time. The most famous recent wreck is almost is 150 years later, which is the Tigre, which is that uh, French merchant ship that I mentioned earlier. Um, and after that, you very quickly get into the uh, 19th century with a slew of vessels from the 1830s and 50s. And then it, it's a continued stream during the 1860s with some Civil War stuff. Uh, and then from there, you very quickly get to the 1899 wrecked ships, and it continues after that. Um, so the earliest historical documented one is 1611, potentially. Um, then we have 1766. But as far as I know, the, all the shipwrecks that were identified archaeologically on Dog Island are from that 1899 hurricane or later. Are there Indian sites on Dog Island? Um, so there are, um, when you say Indian sites, I'm, I'm going to read that as, as prehistoric, if, if that's all right. Um, but in India, there are prehistoric sites on the island. There, a log boat was discovered on the island. A campground along with some lithic and uh, ceramic material was also found on the island. Um, they don't know if it's associated with any particular tribe or a group yet um, because of the uh, the nature of the site and the way it was documented didn't allow us to make a conclusive identification uh, but it's likely from the uh, Fort Walton prehistoric culture based on one shard of ceramic that they found uh, but none of the other sites have uh, provided conclusive diagnostic evidence. Any more questions? Any more, any more comments from anyone? I just think this has been an outstanding, um, um, I just think this has been an outstanding talk tonight. And, um, and mm -hmm. um, uh, Ivor, Ivor, this has been really one, this has been really wonderful. Um, I would ask anybody that, that, that uh, we didn't do too bad tonight, I don't think so. Uh, Anybody that registered and listened and uh, took part in this tonight, uh, feel free to send us any comments about how we did. If I bored the life out of people or took too long or did something otherwise stupid, let me know about it. Um, and we will get better in this. We will get better at this. Uh, um, 
every meeting, I think. I mean, thank you very much to Mary Ellen and Joanna Oates and Brendan, of course, for putting this together for us. And uh, I think we've discovered something here. Thank you, everyone. I think uh, with, no, with no other questions, I think that we will uh, we'll all go, so go get some food. Since we didn't have any food at the meeting, I guess we'll, we can all go get some food and, uh, and get ready for next month. Remember, next month is the fun-filled 2000 election and its aftermath. So, um, so that, should, that should be something. Uh, thank you all very much. Thank you, Ivor. Thank you guys for having me. Bye -bye. I appreciate it. <laughs> Bye. Uh, we will all leave now. <laughs> <laughs>